Hey guys, in today's video, I want to show you the differences between a classic two-handed backhand, a modern two-handed backhand, and a next-gen two-handed backhand. Now, before I start, I need to clarify a few things so that this video makes more sense. The two-handed backhand turns out to be one of the most complex shots in tennis. I'm sure you've heard me say that if you take a look at the top 100 forehands on the ATP or the WTA Tour, you're going to see 100 different styles. This is very much the case for the two-handed backhand as well. So you're gonna see variations in the prep phase. Some players will have the hands quite low, other players will have the hands higher as they loop the racket back. Some players will have the racket head way above the level of the grip. When the racket goes all the way back, other players are gonna shallow out their racket head a little bit more. And within each category of backhands that I'm gonna demonstrate and explain today, you're gonna to see a variety of styles. So let's get started with the classic two-handed backhand. So players like Chris Everett, Jimmy Connor, so Bjorn Borg had classic two-handed backhands. So Chris Everett had a very straight take back. She would keep her hands low, the racket head would be in line with the handle and she would go forward into the ball and finish somewhere around here. So it was overall a very short shot. Bjorn Borg on the other hand also kept his hands low as he took the racket back but he had more of a pendulum swing where the racket would go up in the back before dropping down now very similar to a lot of other male players back in those days that utilized two-handed backhands Bjorn Borg would let go with his non-dominant hand and finish the two-handed backhand with his dominant hand only now Bjorn Borg did have a tremendous amount of spin on his two-handed backhand on the other hand Jimmy Connors did not Connors had more of a flat backhand but similarly to Borg. He would take the racket back where the racket head would be slightly above the handle. He didn't have much of a pendulum swing where the racket went up like Borg, but he also didn't finish much. The racket would stop somewhere around here and he would often let go with his non-dominant hand. Now the swing paths between Borg and Connors were completely different and that explains why Borg had a lot of spin and Connors didn't. So if you take a look at the swing path of Connors, the tip of the racket would stay towards the outside as he finished, while on Borg, the tip of the racket would come over the ball this way as he finished his two-hander. So the difference there is that Borg with his more vertical finish was able to put more top spin on his two-hander. So the big difference on the modern backhand compared to the classic backhand is not so much in the prep phase but rather in the finish. So the stroke overall became longer and players started utilizing their bodies a lot more. So the modern two-handed backhand had a finish where the elbows went way up and the racket would go over the dominant shoulder. Now all two-handed backhands, even the classic one, have torso rotation. It is impossible to hit a two-handed backhand without torso rotation. But on the modern two-handed backhand, you see more continuing rotation. So players will rotate into the contact and then when they get towards the finish part of the stroke, they continue to rotate and their chest will be turned towards the side fence. Now, just like on the classic backhand, when we're talking about the preparation, you're gonna see a tremendous amount of different styles on players. But let me just give you three main styles. And let's start with the WTA style. So on this particular style, we have to take into account the timing of the two-hander. And four years ago, I made a video titled Backhand Timing. And in this video, I explained that you should initiate your stroke when the ball bounces on your side or the court. A lot of people were wondering, hey, Nick, what when the ball comes faster or deeper? Well, you still keep the same timing, but you reduce the amount of loop and backswing that you take. So the perfect timing for the two in the back end is to initiate the stroke when the ball bounces. So what you will see on the WTA Tour among some of the greatest two-handed backhands such as Sharapova or Azarenka is that they start looping the racket back like this. And as the racket drops, it will actually settle slightly behind their body. Now on the ATP Tour, players like Chilich and Zverev will have a similar timing. They will loop the racket, the hands will go up and now the racket will drop on the hitting side of the body as opposed to behind the body like you see on some WTA players. Now the advantage of this timing is that the stroke is continuous so there's absolutely no stoppage 
in the stroke. Players start to go back with their racket and the racket does not stop anymore. It's a very continuous, very flowing, very effortless type of rhythm. Now, in my opinion, Novak Djokovic has the greatest two-handed backhand in the history of tennis and his rhythm is different. So Novak does not have a continuous rhythm. He gets into his loading phase quite early. So when the ball bounces, Novak is already here in his loading phase. So the racket does pause. It is not a continuous backhand. Now the reason why Novak Djokovic's backhand is effective despite its lack of continuity is the fact that the two-handed backhand torso rotation is sequenced differently to the forehand, for example. So on the forehand, you have a loop and you do want to open prior to the racket going forward as the racket is dropping. On the two-handed backhand, when you start going forward, you are simultaneously going to rotate. So you don't need to open up early. So in essence, you don't really need to loop the racket so that you can start opening early. As long as that racket is slightly above the handle, you're going to get the racket to drop and you'll be able to accelerate into the ball. And now we get to the next gen two-handed backhand. Now the ATP categorizes any player that's below the age of 20 as next gen. So you'll always have new next gen players and the players that i'm going to mention they don't really qualify for next gen anymore but they are young players and this is why i'm calling this backhand the next gen backhand so i'm going to use three players as an example of the next gen backhand and these three players are rublev sinner and alcaraz now this is a backhand that's extremely difficult to pull off because the stroke is not continuous and the stroke has to be held extremely long. So let me explain what I mean by that. Players will wait with their racket towards the right. Now, this in itself is not a problem because some players will also start here with the racket, but as the ball bounces, the racket will go back into the slot right here where the tip of the racket goes towards the back fence and they will accelerate from here. You'll see a lot of these type of backhands in the modern backhand as well. But the next gen two-handed backhands main characteristic is its unique timing. So if you take a look at Rublev, for example, he puts the racket right here and he doesn't initiate the stroke at the bounce. He waits in this position until the ball is very close to his racket, well after he has bounced on his side of the court, and that's when he accelerates forward. Now what ends up happening, the racket goes into a lag and then forward. It is so fast you can't see it with the naked eye. It's only observable in slow motion. So it's almost like a slap shot. The racket starts here, it goes back and then goes forward again. The instinct that I have is to start going back around the bounce of the ball. So I have to really force myself and train myself to wait as long as possible until the ball is very close to my racket to start going forward. So the degree of difficulty on this backhand is extremely high. And it's also a backhand that lacks in continuity. So when you just look at Rublev play, you know that the backhand doesn't look continuous. It looks like he's batting the ball. It's not a long flowing stroke that builds up momentum by any means. Now Carlos Alcaraz on the other hand has a slightly similar take back. He's a little bit higher up. He's not quite as far to the right, but he is a little bit to the right. And he has the exact same timing as Rublev. Alcaraz waits in this position until the ball is very close to his racket, so well after he has bounced. And just like Rublev, he's forced to accelerate really fast and the racket whips into a lag and then goes forward. Now Sinner, on the other hand, has one of the most amazing two-handed backhands that I've ever seen. In the analysis, I couldn't even believe my eyes what I was seeing because Sinner's two-handed backhand, as we all know, is unbelievably powerful. So when you see Sinner and Alcaraz exchange cross-court backhand rallies, you'll see that Sinner, first of all, has a lot more power than Alcaraz, but also his backhand looks like it's longer. It looks like there's more range of motion. Like I said, it looks like a slingshot backhand and Alcaraz's backhand almost looks like a bunt. It looks as if Alcaraz is muscling the ball while Sinner isn't. And the reason for that is simply that Sinner has a far bigger lag and he has more range of motion compared to Rublev and Alcaraz. As I said in the beginning of the video within each category of backhands, you're gonna see different styles. And while I categorize Yannick Sinner's two-handed backhand as next-gen. He has a different style from most next-gen backhands. So here's the bounce of the ball and Sinner's racket head is on the hitting side of the body. But also his arms are very extended and his hands are quite low. 
So as the ball starts coming towards center, he's going to stay on the hitting side of the body. This is why center's backhand is a next-gen backhand. You can see how long he stays on the hitting side. The ball is very close to him. He's still on the hitting side of the body. But the difference between Rublev or Alcaraz, for example, is that they will stay when the racket hits this area right here. Sinner does not. Sinner starts taking his hands closer to his body and the racket ends up whipping backwards much more compared to Rublev and Alcaraz, for example. So in other words, he gets more range of motion and a greater lag. So he's going to start moving the hands while keeping them on the hitting side of the body. And only when the ball is very close, he starts taking them behind the body a little bit further. This is why Sinner's backhand looks like a slingshot. Rublev, on the other hand, as well as all other next-gen two-handed backhand players that I've been able to find, have a similar timing to Sinner with one key difference, and that is that the hands do not get closer to the body. So Rublev, at the bounce of the ball, has his racket on the outside, and he's going to keep the racket on the outside until... The ball is extremely close to him. You can see here that the ball is hidden by his right shoulder, but the ball is very close to his body and it is here where he initiates the stroke. So in essence, Rublev's path to the ball is shorter than Sinner's because his hands stay in the same position while Sinner's hands get closer to his body. And it's for that reason why players such as Alcaraz and many others have a two-handed backhand that looks more like a muscle shot, while Sinner's backhand looks more like a slingshot. So just to make you guys understand the big difference between a next-gen backhand and a modern backhand is the fact that players wait on the hitting side of the body with their racket head and their hands far longer compared to the modern backhand. It is why this type of backhand looks more abrupt and not as continuous. And when I observe new players coming up next gen or even players that are the ages between 20 and 25, I'm seeing more and more of these backhands. I want to tell you that while this backhand is not continuous, it's a fundamentally sound backhand. Why? Because all these players achieve a full lag. Of course, there are a few exceptions and I've made videos in the past about the players that don't always get a full lag and they don't have backhands that can match up with Djokovic or Sinner. So the fundamental element of the backhand is number one, independent of your style, the racket needs to lag behind. This is sufficient, but the racket can also lag further behind. This will often depend also on your arm structure because the two-handed backhand can be hit with a wide variety of arm structures. Both arms straight, both arms bent, the arms can be reversed you'll see players that have the dominant arm straight going to the contact and then the non-dominant arm is straight and the dominant arm is bent so you're going to see a tremendous amount of styles it also depends how far away from the body your hands are so generally if your hands are a little bit further away from your body the racket will stay more on the hitting side if you have your hands closer to your body what will happen as you load your back and you're going to turn your back towards the other side that is the perfect loading position independent of your style you got to make a big coil so if you have your hands close to your body naturally the racket is going to go a little bit behind the body as you go forward if you have your hands a little bit further away from your body with that big coil you can keep the racket more in a straight line independent of style all two-handed backhand players have to have the ability to shorten their back end when they have to. For example, on the return of serve, players need to have the ability to shorten their take back and deflect the ball back in play. Or if the ball is rifled deep, very close to their feet, players need to have the ability to shorten their stroke and deflect the ball back into play. So I'm advising against the next gen two-handed backhand. What ends up happening with a lot of players, they like this preparation here, but the racket never lags behind it. They're just going at the ball like this. They don't get any range of motion. And their two-handed backhand suffers a lot of power and control. And let me end this video by telling you who the father of the next gen two-handed backhand is. And that is Andre Agassi. If you pay close attention to Andre Agassi's backhand, he has the exact same timing as Alcaraz, as Rublev. Yes, his style is a little bit different, but Andre waits with his racket slightly to the right, and he starts initiating when that ball is very close to his racket, and just like Rublev, just like Alcaraz, the racket just whips back and goes forward.
And now for comedic effect, let me demonstrate the next gen two-handed back. The key is to be able to wait as long as possible in this position and just basically whip the two-handed back end over the net. I'm gonna tell you this does require athleticism. Ah! And it requires exceptional timing. More time. Ah, no way. Again. Ah. All right, one more. Ah. 